Jeremiah chapter 48 and Titus chapter 1. I've been, uh, I don't know, you go through Sunday school there and you go through the books in the New Testament on Christian character and Christian conduct and uh, and those things and and it's some uh, tough stuff to teach, it's tough stuff to, to preach when you're talking about controlling the flesh and, uh, you know, just trying to take care of the things that you're supposed to as a Christian as far as conduct goes and things that are hard to do, you know, uh, um, just controlling the flesh and those things that we uh, have, tr we all have trouble with, and those lessons are sometimes are hard to teach. A lot of times it's just because you know how big of a sinner you are, and uh, sometimes it's because you know everybody else knows how big of a sinner you are, <laughs> and you're sitting there and you're saying this stuff, and you know you're not doing it, and... Uh, it's just it's it's tough. It's tough to teach. It's tough to it's tough to listen to messages like that as well. But uh, tonight um, uh, we're not going to be on that side of the thing. So tonight it's going to be a little more fun to preach because although that stuff's true and we got to do it, at the same time there is a balance to Christianity. And most of the time when it comes to balance, we are always talking about maybe. Uh, uh, trying to make sure that we're being kind and we're being courteous and stuff like that. But also there's a time where uh, people are too kind and they're too courteous, or at least that's what they say it uh, uh, is. And uh, sometimes you have to uh, shell the corn. Sometimes what you have to do is you have to be prepared and you have to be ready to defend uh, the Word of God. you got to be ready to uh, convince the gainsayers. And that's what we're going to be uh, preaching about tonight. Well, we're going to start off in uh, Jeremiah chapter 48. Verse 10, Jeremiah 48, verse 10, the Bible says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Now, I get around to a lot of meetings around and uh, go to different places and hear different preachers preach, and it seems like every time that you're around a place like that and you've got a preacher there that's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, not completely our stripe, it seems like they always have to go out of their way to... Uh, uh, talk about, uh, they, first of all, if you're a Bible believer, they're going to classify you as a Ruckmanite. And then they're going to talk to everybody. If, the, if they know some guy that's a nut or some crazy guy that that uh, doesn't have any kind of discernment, they act like that's the way all Ruckmanites are or all Bible believers are. And then they want to preach against you. And the whole time you're sitting there, if they know there's somebody that believes the book or have studied after Dr. Ruckman, they think they have to... Uh, um, uh, put you straight and let you know, you know, well, you're just a little too rough and you need to be kind and you need to be courteous and you need all this stuff. And so you're just kind and courteous and you sit there and you take it and you listen to it and uh, and you go on. And uh, and I'm sure there's some people that need that type of message. But with that said, uh, there's a time that you've got to be ready to go. And the Bible says here in verse 10, it says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. And there is a time when you're doing a work for the Lord that you've just got to pull the sword out and you've got to start cutting. And people that uh, you're around people a lot of times and there's a lot of other people around and they're saying things that aren't true and they're sitting there and they're leading other people down the wrong path and as kind and courteous as you can sometimes, you try to correct them, but sometimes uh, they just have to be rebuked and they have to be rebuked sharply. And sometimes you just got to pull the sword out and you got to cut them open right there in front of everybody. And the reason is you do something like that is because a lot of times there's other people that's around that's being led the wrong way. And by being quiet, you make it seem like what they're saying is true. And they'll be saying uh, something. They'll make a remark about the Bible, about some doctrine or, or whatever it is. And just by being quiet a lot of times what we do or is we're just kind of saying, okay, they're right. And a lot of times people that's around you, they'll just look at you and they'll... They'll look at you like, uh, well, what do you think? Because they know that you're a preacher or they know you're a Christian and that you are supposed to know something. And if you just sit there and you're quiet, then they're thinking that, okay, everything's good. But sometimes you have to uh, just pull out the sword and start cutting. And uh, the people that get offended, uh, get offended. And then the Bible says in Titus chapter 1, 
and go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. <clears throat> in Titus chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 9, He says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Christians are, all, are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And so sometimes, according to the Bible right here, as Paul's talking to Titus, he's saying, listen, he said, there's some times, Titus, when, you know what, things are going to be tight, things are going to be tough, and you're just going to have to start talking, and you're just going to have to uh, uh, shut some people up. And Paul, when he begins to talk right here, it doesn't look like he's interested in uh, making any friends. He's not interested in who gets mad at the way he talks. He's not trying to sugarcoat it. He ain't trying to make it sound good. What he's saying is, he says, listen, he said there's some vain talkers, there's some deceivers out there, and their mouths need to be stopped. He's not saying, hey, we need to, you know, you, you need to talk to these people so they, you know, so they'll know, you know, that uh, which side, you know, that you're on and which side they're on. And you don't really want to, you may want to make them mad. Paul's saying, you know what you need to do is you need to, you need to rebuke them sharply because their mouth needs to be shut up. Now look over at, uh, go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is uh, sent out on a missionary journey, and he's still called Saul here. This is when he becomes Paul. And in Acts chapter 13, he gets sent out uh, as a missionary. And when he gets sent out, he ends up going here and uh, uh, starting to witness to somebody. Now, in Acts chapter 13, look at verse 6. The Bible says, And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country. Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, which is exactly what they were saying over there in Titus, turning people away from it. And then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now notice that. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. And look what it says. He set his eyes on him and said this. O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? You know what Paul's saying? He's saying, look here, you demon-possessed man. You need to be quiet. You're messing this whole thing up. I'm sitting here trying to witness to somebody, and you're withstanding me, and you're messing this thing up. And you know what Paul does? He looks him right in the eyes and tells him he's demon-possessed and that he needs to quit. Sometimes what needs to happen is, is you need to just take somebody that uh, believes something different and they're messing some things up and there's some times where you just have to pull the sword out and you have to start cutting and you just have to start hacking. You have to start drawing the blood, drawing some blood. And that's what Paul's doing right there. Now over in Titus, what he's saying is this. He's saying uh, by uh, sound doctrine, you need to be able to convince the gainsayers. And so what that means is, is that you need to understand doctrine. You need to understand some things about doctrine and other beliefs so when that comes up, you're able to handle yourself. Uh, when you get there and you end up dealing with somebody that's a church of Christ, you need to be able to know what do they believe, where are they going to go in their scriptures, what are they going to do. You know they're going to go to Acts 2.38. You know they're going to go to John chapter 3. You need to know some things about getting in this fight and being able to handle a sword and being able to take somebody like that and take them to the cleaners and make them shut up. That's what you got to do. And they'll take that Bible and they'll take it and they'll say, well, see here, the Bible says, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, says uh, Acts 2.38, you repent and be baptized for the mission of sins, and you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. And they'll take Acts 2.38, and they're going to say, look at this right here. Now, what about this? You've got to be baptized to be saved. You've got to have a water baptism to be saved. You've got to be able to know what to do in a situation like that. I remember one time I was dealing with the Church of Christ, and, and what I did was, you know, uh, I'd pull out my two-edged sword, and the problem was I only had one side of it sharpened. I didn't know everything there was to know about Church of Christ and that stuff, so I was in the middle of a battle, and he pulled a verse on me, and it didn't make any it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know how to answer it. 
Turn over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Uh, this guy right here, he wasn't a church of Christ, but he was. Uh, I'd, we'd been witnessing to him. I think it was actually me and Judd Ellis had been witnessing to him. And uh, his wife was church of Christ, so he'd been, he hadn't been in church at all, so we start witnessing to him. So he starts going to church at the church of Christ, and they begin to deal with him. So we're sitting here trying to talk to him about just uh, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's beginning to ask questions about water baptism. And so one day we're sitting here, and he brings me to this uh, passage here in John chapter 3. And it says, uh, verse 5, it says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he showed me that verse. And he says, What does it mean there to be born of water? And I said, Listen. I didn't have a clue what he was saying. I didn't know how to answer that question. I didn't know what it meant. So I said, Well, I said, Listen. I said, I've given you answers for everything in this thing, and you don't ever uh, go by it every time I give you an answer. You just go to somewhere else. I said, maybe it would be better if you just listen to somebody else give you an answer on this. I said, at lunchtime, I said, we'll go over to Gary Boyd's house, and I'll let him tell you about this answer. Then maybe you'll believe it coming from him. <laughs> That's because I didn't know the answer. <laughs> and so I talked to Gary, and Gary said, well, come on over there. So we come over there, and he takes the Bible right there in John chapter 3, and he starts reading, and he says, Look up in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So right there's the context. He's talking about a physical birth. He talks about being born again. Nicodemus is only thinking about a physical birth. And so it's, there's the context. So that's what they're talking about, a physical birth. When a lady gets ready to have a baby, the Bible says that her water, the Bible says... What happens is her water breaks. And uh, when her water breaks, uh, that's when she's going to have that baby. And so and being born of water is a physical birth. And you can see it right there in the context. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered. He asked a question. How can, can you go into the mother's womb and be born again? He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, physical, and of the spirit, spiritual, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And he explains it in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And Brother Gary shows that to me, and I'm sitting there in the living room. Me and this other guy sitting here, we're both hanging on the edge of our seat. So I think I'm getting ready to have to be a church of Christ. And uh, sitting there, and uh, Brother Gary's sitting there like that, and he's giving us that answer, and I'm reading it up through there, man. And the Lord opens that up to me, and I'm like, whoo, and I go, pow. I said, now see there. Now, where, how does it get no easier than that right there? See, they're lying to you. I was scared to death the whole time. I didn't know. But you know what you got to be able to do? you got to be able to learn what they believe. you got to know what they believe. you got to know where they're going. And you may fall on your sword a couple of times. But if you really believe this book and this is really what you are counting on to get you to heaven, then you can't just decide, well, you know what, I'm just... I'm just going to choose this way, they can choose this way, and we'll let them choose that way, and we're all just going to choose the way we want to. No, that don't work. Listen, I really want to go to heaven. I really do. And when it comes to going to heaven, you know what I want? I want to know the truth. If it's Church of Christ, then that's good, fine. That's what I'll do. If it's Mormon, that's what I'll do. If it's a Catholic, that's what I'll do. If it's a Muslim, that's what I would do. Because you know what? If I believe I'm going to heaven, I'm going to do what it is. I don't care who else has done what. If my mom's this, if my dad's this, if grandma's this, you know what? I want to go to heaven. And so I'm going to do what's right. And so I wanted to know exactly. Everybody can't be right because they're all different. Jesus Christ said there's one way to heaven. He said, He's the way, the truth, and the life. Any man that cometh unto the Father must come by Him. Go look over at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we, not know, we uh, know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You say, what does that mean? That means Catholics are wrong. 
You don't go by Mary, and you don't go by the sacraments, and you don't go by tradition, and you don't go by the church fathers, and you don't get inside a booth and confess your sins to another man who's as big a sinner as we are. According to the Bible, there's one way. Jesus, uh, Paul said there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So guess what? Church of Christ is out. Catholicism's out. Jehovah's Witnesses are out. Mormons are out. Muslims are out. Well, you just think you're right. No, I think the Bible's right. That's what's right. And sometimes you just have to pull the sword out and you just need to know what you believe and why you believe it. And uh, the same comes uh, along with the King James Bible issue. You should have enough to you to know some things about this Bible and why you believe the King James Bible's right. Not just for yourself. You say, I know, brother. It don't matter what they say. I've got it, I've got it down. I know what it's going to be. And I know exactly what I believe. And I don't care. Nobody's going to change my mind. Well, what about some people that's around you when the issue comes up? I mean, that's the whole point over there. It's not the whole point. But that's one point in 1 Kings chapter 18. When Elijah's on top of that mount, on top of Mount Carmel, and he's sitting there having that debate. Let me tell you something, friends. He ain't trying to win those false prophets. He ain't trying to win them. There's 850 prophets up there that he knows they're not going to believe anything he's got to say. You say, well, who's he talking to? He said, how long halt ye between two opinions? He's talking to the children of Israel. There's going to be some people around it sometimes, and they're going to be asking you questions about the King James Bible, you and somebody else, and they're sitting there listening, and they're listening for an answer, and if you don't have an answer, you know what? They may not be convinced the King James Bible is the Word of God. They're not going to say a word because they're not that way, but they're interested in what's going on in the conversation. Could you hold your water when it comes to the King James Bible issue? The Bible says you need to be able to convince the gainsayers. A gainsayer is somebody who's going to be contradictory. They're going to be going against what you say. They're trying to go opposite of everything that you've got to say. And it don't matter where you're at, whether you're at home uh, listening to TV, there's going to be gainsayers there. Whether you're at work and you're arguing with somebody there at work about the Bible or about issues, there's going to be somebody at work that knows some stuff or knows some questions to say. And Well, how do we just know we're right? Well, how do you just think you're right? How do you, and they're always playing the devil's advocate. There, there's always somebody there that's got some questions that's going to mess you up if you ain't got the answers. And you've got to, always, you've got to have the answers. And God expects you to have the answers. It says over there in Titus 1.9, He says you need to be able to convince the gainsayers. Now, look over to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. The last couple of weeks, uh, there's an issue came up, and it was uh, <clears throat> about uh, the Bible becoming the state book. And I didn't think a lot about it at first. I thought, I mean, I thought it was pretty cool. I didn't even know it was happening. I thought it was pretty neat that... Uh, the Bible was going to be the state book. And uh, I didn't realize, I, mean, I, I guess I should have thought it, but I didn't even think about what a big issue it was going to be. So everybody's been arguing about it. And the bad thing is you have Christians. Christians. you got Christians that are saying, well, you know, brother, separation of church and state. What? What are you talking about? And you're sitting there and you're listening to them. Well, you know, you, you, you just can't have a, a preference, you know, of religion. We can't make a law that's preferring one religion. It's talking about a book. It ain't talking about a religion. It's talking about the Bible. And number one, here's the thing, even if it does become the state book, does that mean everybody's going to start reading it and everybody's going to start doing it? I mean, honestly, Tennessee history, I learned out, I learned what the state flower was. It's the iris. And I said, I, that's not my favorite flower. You know, I, I could, the state tree, the tulip poplar. Well, I mean, what, I don't even, I couldn't even show you a tulip poplar. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even show it to you. It don't make, make no difference to me. I'm thinking this law ain't going to make no difference. It ain't going to make anybody like the Bible more than anybody uh, more than any other book. It's just a state book. I think it's a great book to be the state book. But what happens is, is as Christians, you know what we do? We're not, uh, we're not armed. We're not ready. We're not able to defend uh, the questions that's going to be coming up. Now here in Acts, Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul, he goes up against some things just like you do at work. And here's what should happen to you. First of all, when uh, people start talking about the Bible or they start dogging out the Bible or they start dogging out Christians or Christianity and, and they start talking about how stupid Christians are and, and how uh, uneducated Christians are and how stupid they are, that's what they say. And that's what you're going to hear. And, and how shallow they are and how ignorant they are. And, and they just believe this, this almighty God and they're just going to do what He says. And, and they act like they're so much more smarter than you. You know what it should do for you? It should light your fire is what it should do for you. Um, 
if uh, uh, if somebody came over to my house and started talking to me and uh, they started uh, um, talking bad about my wife, it it wouldn't it wouldn't be pretty. I, mean, I, I don't even care. I don't even care if they were right. They just ain't gonna do it. They just ain't gonna do it. And if I'm looking at all these men sitting here today, it'd be the same way. Uh, you're not going to be able to go to a real man's house and start talking to him about his wife and dogging his wife out and talking about how stupid his wife is or any of that stuff without him getting mad. And it's the same thing with this Bible or with Christians or with Jesus Christ. When people begin to talk about Jesus Christ and they act like uh, uh, they start dogging him out like he wasn't real or, or they say things about him, there's a lot of people who act like he's a sissy or that uh, there's people even talk about him being a homosexual. Those things ought to fire you up. You've got the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 17, in verse 16, look what it says. It says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, he's waiting on uh, Paul and uh, Silas, or waiting on Paul, Paul's waiting on Silas and Timothy to get down there, and while he's sitting there, he's looking around, he's in that city, and what he sees is a bunch of philosophers, <laughs> and they're taking around, and they're all uh, sitting here talking about philosophy and, and what they believe and what this one believes. And look what it says happens to Paul. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. The Bible says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. You know what it ought to do? It ought to get you fired up. Boys, you know what it ought to do? It ought to get you fired up. When you're at school and there's somebody talking about the Bible or there's somebody talking about Christianity or they're misrepresenting Jesus Christ or they're misrepresenting Christians, it ought to get you fired up. Instead of just sitting there with your head down and, and act like, well, you know, they're probably right. You know, there's a lot more proof about Plato than there is us. There's no more proof about Plato than there is us. There's no more proof about, about uh, their scientific findings than there is creation. There's not more. And you say, well, I just don't know. I just hate to get in the middle of an argument and look stupid. Well, look stupid. I mean, the best thing to do, it's better to get in the middle of a fight and fight than it is to sit back and let somebody uh, badmouth Jesus Christ or badmouth Christianity and they talk about Christians, about uh, how they're uh, bigots into slavery and, and all this stuff, they'll get started on it. You know what you need to do sometimes when they start dogging out Christians? Say, well, let me tell you something. I don't know about the Christians you know, but the Christians I know, you know what I see them do? I see them buy food for hungry kids. You know what I do? I see them send thousands of dollars to missionaries across the world. I've seen, uh, I've seen Christians buy vehicles for kids that couldn't afford a vehicle when they got out of college. I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, 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 Christians give money for kids to go to camp and they don't charge any money. I see them start vacation Bible schools and go through there and you begin to talk about what all Christians do and you defend them and say, Now, I don't know the Christians you're dealing with, but the ones I'm dealing with, I see the good works that they do. You defend them. You say, why? Because they're worth defending. Don't let these people define what Christianity is or define what the world is or define who Jesus Christ is or about this Bible or what it is or how it came to be or how much proof there is about this Bible. Learn some things and get in there and begin to fight. You know, I remember when uh, growing up, um, you'd, get in, you'd be at school and there'd be a fight. <clears throat> and you'd see these guys getting ready to fight. And you'd think about this one guy, and you'd think, man, this guy's going to get whipped bad. Matter of fact, I could whip that guy right there. I just can't believe he's fighting this guy. And in your head, you just never thought a lot about this guy. And then they get in a fight, and he gets whipped. <laughs> he gets beat up. But you see, there's a couple of times he got a couple of good licks in, but the one thing that you realized about this guy was is that he was going to fight. And when you got done with it and you watched this fight, even though you thought he couldn't whip that guy, you know what happened a lot of times? You didn't want to fight that guy. A lot of times that kid only had to fight one time and then nobody else would mess with him. You say, why? Because they knew he'd fight. And, they, and if you've ever seen any type of fights, here's what happens. You know, you say, well, so-and-so won, so-and-so won. Uh, maybe they got the better end of the deal, but I don't know if either one of them won. Most of the time when I've seen a fight, both of them's bleeding. Both of them's got black eyes. You watch a heavyweight boxing match. Both of them's beat to death. I mean, the only one, they're both sitting there. Ain't neither one of them got any teeth. One of them smiling because they won, and, but they look the same <laughs> most of the time. And you get in a fight, you're going to get hurt. And when you begin to fight, that's all it takes usually is one fight. And then what happens is you don't have to fight again because most people realize he's going to fight. We don't want to get in it. And so you get this Bible. You begin to learn how to defend this Bible. There's some things that they're going to say. Look at this right here. What happened? He gets, his, uh, he gets started here and he gets stirred up. In verse 17 it says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews 
and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers. You ever heard somebody say, oh, I just don't believe you should argue about the Bible. The Apostle Paul ain't just arguing about the Bible. He's arguing with four different groups right here. It says, he disputed, uh, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him with them, uh, with them that met with him. So he's arguing with Jews. He's got devout persons. He's fighting right here. Then there's just regular people showing up here in the daily market. He's arguing with them. But you know what? Paul knew what he believed. He knew what he believed. He knew why he believed it. And then when he got done with that mess right there, he turned around, looked up on Bar's Hill, and saw some philosophers up there. And he said, I'm going to go get these guys. You say, what happened? He got fired up. And you know what happens? We get so caught up with this world and we get so caught up with what's going on, we don't think about Christianity. We don't think about defending the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't think about defending this Bible. And we don't have the answers for people. We don't want to get involved and we don't care. But man, you, you get somebody in an argument about a sports team, and the next thing you know, here it goes. But well, let me just tell you, we won this championship. Well, we won this championship. Well, we won one last time before you did. And you get going, they get fired up. They'll argue about sports. They'll argue about anything else. They'll argue about uh, family. You better not say anything about my family. I mean, they'll argue about But when it comes to God, you know what Christians ought to do? Sometimes they just need to pull a sword out and they need to start fighting. Amen. And the Apostle Paul sitting here, and you know what dispute means in the, in the Greek? It means to argue. That's what it means. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. What does that mean? That means they, they got up with they They got them some. You know, you know boys, you know, how, you know how it is. You get start talking smack, and you look at them and you say, you don't want none of this. You don't want none of this right here. And then they turn around and they start talking back to you. That's what happened to those Epicureans. They really didn't want none. But they didn't have no choice. They had to encounter Paul because Paul saw them, and he went up there. So these Epicureans and these Stoics are there, and he's getting ready to argue with them. Epicureans, basically, uh, what they believe is, is that the, what, what life is, is just everything should be good. No pain, no worries, hakuna matata. That's Epicureans. No worries. Everything's good. If it's painful, then stay away from it. It's just, we just indulge in everything that's good. And, then, and they don't believe, and they believe that when you die, that's it. They believe there's God's. But they ain't one of them, and when they die, there's no punishment. There's no rewards. You're here on the earth. You just need to enjoy it, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. That's what they, that's what they believe. And then you got these Stoics. And the Stoics believe that you need to control yourself. You need to be in control. No passion, no compassion. You don't get excited. You just, there's no emotions at all. You just do what's right. You keep your body under subjection. It's like will worship, and you never show any kind of uh, emotions. That's why people will talk about somebody and say, well, he's very stoic. They're saying he don't have no emotions to him. He's just like that right there. And so that's who Paul's going against. He's got these Epicureans and he's got these Stoics. And these Epicureans, they don't even believe in a resurrection. But now here's what happens. It says they encountered him and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And so the first thing you're going to see is they attacked this person. They started... They started to make fun of him. They called him a babbler. They said, what's this babbler got to say? What's he babbling on about? What have you got to say? You get on these comments on the internet there, and you'll, be, you'll see an article there, and you'll see all these people. They'll start dogging out Christian, Christians and calling them goat herders or calling them names and stuff like that. And you know what? That's what's going to happen. You might as well get ready for it. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to call you those names, and you've got to have an answer for them. And Paul had an answer for them. Paul started talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he knew those Epicureans didn't believe in the resurrection. Look down in verse 32. It says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, <laughs> some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So sometimes you're going to get in the middle of a fight, they're going to make fun of you guys. What are you going to do when they make fun of you? <clears throat> verse 19 also, they attacked his message. It says, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemed to be set forth of strange gods. And down in verse 32, they attacked his uh, doctrine. So you need to be able to, to handle those things. You know what they'll do? is they'll talk to you about how stupid uh, Christians are, and they'll tell you that you need to, uh, um, you know, you need to read more books. That's the 